community <laughs> to speak about their work. And, and tonight we really have people from our library community that um, we are going to hear from. So um, from photography to fashion illustration, fiction, writing to art, these talks encompass a multitude of projects and themes, and they really celebrate cre creativity. So today, um, our FIT authors are Associate Professor Carly Spina and Head of Research and Instruction Services here at FIT, and Assistant Professor Helen Lang, Instructional Design Librarian. Welcome. They'll discuss their book, E-Textiles in Libraries, a practical guide for librarians. The book features key information about the materials and techniques you'll need to know, examples of libraries that have found success with e-textiles, and step-by-step -step advice on program creation, and projects that can be used for fun and engaging library programs. So thank you for being here, and I'll let you guys take it away, Carly and Helen. Thank you so much, Maria. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm just going to share our slides. Um, hopefully you can now see our screen and here's our presentation. There we go. Now it should be full screen. Um, as Maria said, we're going to be talking about our book e um, textiles in libraries. My name is Carly Spina and my co author is Helen Lane and Helen's going to be getting Hi. started. So, uh, next slide. So um, I never assume that I have an audience who is familiar with everything that I'm talking about. Otherwise, you know, why turn up? Um, so I'm going to begin with a little bit of background uh, information about the maker movement and libraries. Um, they're a natural fit. Um, I'm sure you've seen that there are a lot of uh, libraries that have maker spaces and events uh, on a regular basis. And the maker movement, just to give it a definition, is a cultural trend that is frequently focused on technology, um, which really uh, tries to place more value on an individual's um, ability to create uh, than to consume. Um, in this case, um, oftentimes technology, but also other types of, of skills um, are, 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 are fostered and built. And libraries, um, likewise, are places for creativity and exploration that are interdisciplinary that stress the individual's ability to participate, right, in a creative uh, process and in a research process. Um, and it's an environment that gives both content and context for what that person is creating or doing. I think art libraries in particular, um, you can very visibly see the interdisciplinary nature of what's going on um, because art libraries are often places where we find students um, in the process of creating their work while they're surrounded by the books in our stacks with the uh, librarians present and other staff present at service desks. And um, it kind of already is a maker space to a certain extent. Um, so next slide. So our own experience with um, maker spaces at the FIT library is a little bit of a different model. And I bring it up because I want to encourage anybody who's come to this talk, wondering if they really have the resources to have a maker space or um, is to look at our model. Um, our model was to borrow an idea from retail with pop-up shops. And instead of having a sort of more or less permanent maker space with equipment right there and somebody always around. We chose instead to go with pop-up maker events that we entitled Maker Minds events. These events were sponsored, uh, they were a collaborative effort between the library uh, and uh, the printing uh, facility that we have on campus that has was at one time under the library's um, uh, authority and is now part of IT, but it is a collaborative effort. And when this program started, we decided we really wanted to make sure that everything we did was very hands on, that it was uh, very open and free. So it was never really geared towards just one degree program or one area of interest. Um, we wanted to make sure that you could walk in with just 
a minimal amount of knowledge about what you were doing and learn something. Um, keeping the price down was very important to us. And we also made sure that we always combined uh, a mix of high and low tech. And if you're hearing a banging sound, that's my cat wanting to get into the room. So I'm gonna go open the door so that she can get in. So, sorry about that. Um, these things happen. So uh, some examples of what you see here, um, the students on the computer are doing a 3D exquisite corpse. Uh, this is obviously not e-textiles, um, but using Sculptress, which is a free software and set up in the computer lab, we invited people in with no nothing more than basic computer skills to have an event and then to come away with a 3D printed object um, gratis. Um, next to that, however, you see something that is uh, not does not appear to be very uh, technology oriented unless you look in close and you'll notice that those are LED lights um, that are being incorporated in the weaving. This is part of our weaving with conductive thread um, program that we put on. And it is um, a really good example of taking an idea um, that seems very uh, the inspiration point, in fact, was the work of a, of a textile artist who has one of these large floor looms with um, multiple shafts and um, all kinds of equipment. And we took that and we sort of reverse designed it to be sort of a proof of concept so that people were learning how to um, make a parallel circuit, incorporate it in a piece of weaving, uh, and have it work, and we needed to keep the price low. Um, and we've discovered, next slide, we've discovered that our e-textile programs are some of our best attended events. Um, there's lots of reasons for this, and perhaps people might assume that it's because we're at a fashion school, and that might be part of it. But we find that people attend the e-textiles events from all different degree programs. Um, Oftentimes people have a, an interest in e-textiles or they have a, a background in some sort of textile art and being able to combine what they already know with something that they want to learn is very intriguing to them. And it takes things up a level from some of the events um, that other groups do, which are fun and bonding types of events, but it, they're also learning something. They're not just uh, coming away with a craft of something they already know how to do. They're adding on to their knowledge in a way that's meaningful and they're learning from each other. Um, and I think there's something very tactile about our e-textile programs and um, all of the students, as I say, come away with something that they've made. Um, so in the corner, we have a, um, this was our Sew Electric uh, project, and this was simply embroidering and using conductive thread and making a simple circuit. And then in the, the main image you see there is a uh, lily pad proto snap. Um, so this is a sewable microcontroller. The large item you see in the middle is the microcontroller, and the objects to the side are various components, both input and output devices. Um, heat sensor, light sensor, LED lights, all of which can be con uh, connected to the microcontroller. In this form, um, it's all attached, but you would literally snap these pieces out um, and, and uh, then sew them into a garment. I'll talk a little bit during question and answer about how we kept the price low for that type of project. Um, but next slide. What um, what this all comes uh, around to is that um, one of the main reasons we wrote the book is that we want to encourage other librarians and other home educators, other, um, other organizations uh, to consider e-textiles in their programming, whether, they, whether you have a formal makerspace or not, um, because E-textiles are bridge skills. Um, textile arts are bridge skills to circuitry and computing. Um, it's a, a very rich kind of medium for mixing traditional craft and technology and has a lot of appeal because of that. Um, it is a great way if you're trying to increase uh, inclusion by 
uh, gender and age. Um, a lot of times your robot robotics, not, I mean, I'm not going to, this is stereotyping perhaps, but a lot of times your, your robotics programs or your Lego programs um, or other Arduino coding programs might end up tra attracting more men or younger people in general, uh, male and female. When you include the textile arts, you have a more diverse audience. Um, and it's a wonderful opportunity for cooperative learning and sharing. Um, it's scalable, affordable, and it's tangible. So e-textiles uh, are a really, really exciting way to go when you're doing making uh, maker events or if you have a maker space. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Carly now. Yes, um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we covered in the book. Um, so to start with, we talked about what are e-textiles because they can actually encompass a lot of different types of electronics in textiles. And we wanted to give some background about the history and what we meant by that, because there are a lot of different applications that are out there right now um, in the commercial market, as well as in maker spaces. So there's a lot of different ways that these are being used in interior design, healthcare, um, even things like um, for assistive technologies, things like um, cute circuits, sound shirt, which is um, a tool that integrates um, e-textiles into a shirt that can be worn and transmits sound to those who cannot hear it. Um, there's a lot of examples about how LED lights can be integrated into textiles and controlled by the wearer or the person um, who has them up as a decorative um, implement in their home. And this is sort of um, something that we really thought was the inspiration that um, and background that people needed to understand where they could go with the types of skills that they were learning through the projects we were going to talk about. So we felt like it was very important to understand that sort of background piece of it. Um, in that same section, we did also talk a little bit about the DIY side of things um, and what there was out there that's available. And that continued in the second section of the book, um, which is all about getting to know e-textiles tools, materials, and supplies. So some of these are items that you've already seen in our earlier slides. Um, there are several different um, companies that make um, supply kits or um, materials that can be used for this, but um, you know, I think that they're they, it, they come and go to some degree. But the ones that um, Helen was already talking about are some of the more popular ones. So um, that um, that lily pad that we saw is one that I think a lot of people. Um, know about and use who are doing e-textiles because it has so many different um, sensors and functions that you can do with that one type. Um, we also talked in that section about the other types of materials that you'll need. So for a lot of these projects, you'll need some sort of conductive um, yarn or thread or conductive um, fabric even, depending on what type you're doing. And Helen is demonstrating that right now, um, what that might look like. Um, and we really wanted to give that background because the supplies are really important for this. You want to make sure that you understand what you need to have available. And that's one of those sensors that Helen is showing now. And um, these components aren't expensive, which is one of the reasons why this is a really approachable um, type of project for an individual or a library or a makerspace or a classroom to do, but they are things that you need to understand and get the right components that will work well together so that you can have a successful project. Because that, it, you know, at the end of the day, you really wanna make sure that the circuits work so that everything will behave the way you want it to. Um, then we talked about e-textile programming in libraries, which I'll talk a little bit more about in um, future sections. And we really were able to learn so much from talking to um, librarians at so many different types of institutions. We already had experience doing Maker Minds at the FIT library, but that's really just one model for including e-textiles in libraries. And what we were able to do by talking to a lot of other libraries was learn what other exciting programs, ideas, and approaches different types of libraries had adopted. 
And um, I think that one of the exciting things about this is that um, it also showed a model for people doing it outside of libraries as well, in that one of the things that many libraries are doing even before the pandemic was offering sort of solo asynchronous e-textiles kits that people could check out or come to the library and pick up. And um, that sort of shows how this can be something that's very versatile. It doesn't even have to be what you normally think of as a big group program necessarily. Um, we also then talked about this more of the specifics about if you are going to do library programming, what do you need to think about and what do you need to do? So um, what you need to think about for planning these. So we've talked about this a little bit, but you know, in there we sort of dove into things like um, timelines, budgets, um, because it is something where you need to have the equipment and you need to have enough of it. But of course, libraries often don't have a lot of funding. So we did think about ways that you could make sure that you had minimized costs and those sorts of things. Um, we talked about what you would want to have in terms of support documentation and instructional materials for those who are participating, um, what, what type of equipment you might want to have, if any. Um, so certainly this can all be handwork, which is most of what we've shown, but some libraries do in their maker spaces offer sewing machines and um, other types of, um, you know, maybe even knitting machines that might be able to be used in these types of projects as well. So thinking a little bit about um, whether or not you needed that or what you might, you know, um, think about if you were considering different equipment and then promoting and assessing e-textile programs. And I think that that's something that's a challenge certainly for a lot of um, libraries and um, maker spaces is how do you get the word out um, for people to actually come to your programs and participate and get excited and really for something like e-textiles and a lot of the STEM programming, also how do you make it feel as though it's inclusive for everyone? So how do you make it feel like everyone is welcome to this? So it's not just something for people who already know how to sew or already know how to weave or already know how to embroider, but at the same time, it's also not something for people who already understand how to put electronics together. And one of the really cool things about e-textiles programming, in my opinion, is that a lot of times you do kind of have two separate audiences coming together. You have some of the people coming with a real strong interest in the technology piece of it and maybe more experience on that side of things. And then you have other people coming with a very strong experience in the crafting and the textile side of things. So maybe they've embroidered for years, but they've never done it with circuitry. And to really have those two different groups both feel comfortable in your program does require some thought. And it's something that I think is really important so that you get a group that is really um, diverse and brings together people with a lot of different perspectives so that they can work together well, because then you've got people who can sort of contribute and answer questions on both pieces of it. And then, of course, we also wanted to talk about assessing your programs to make sure that if you're offering these types of programs over and over again, that they're always improving and building on what you've done in the past. Um, and then we had a section on program ideas. And I think that's something we're also gonna talk about a little bit more later on. And then we also had a section on e-textile resources for your library. So what types of books and resources would you really wanna have on hand in your library? So the, in the next section, I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, the different library programs we spoke uh, to and um, included in our book. And the first one is one that I know I found really exciting, and that is the Brooklyn Fashion Academy. Um, some people may already be aware of this program, um, but it's a really cool program even aside from e-textiles. Um, it was actually created by uh, Lindsay Augustin, who is also the director. It's out of the Brooklyn Public Library, and it is a program that is meant to sort of be um, a training program, an academy, an incubator of sorts for established um, local designers. So it's people who are already working in some element of fashion design but want to take their career to the next level. And they participate in a, I believe, 16-week long program 
um, in which they learn all sorts of different skills, design, business, everything related to sort of taking their life as a designer to that next level. And it culminates in a fashion show. And um, at the same time, they also have a shorter program that's running um, where local high school students are, who are interested in fashion design are also able to participate in a very similar program. And that too um, culminates in a show. And the particular, um, you know, just by coincidence, happy coincidence, um, the year that we were writing this book was also a year when the Brooklyn Fashion Academy, as part of their work, had decided to integrate e-textiles. And they were working specifically with Stitch Kit Tech Packs. That's this image here um, to the side. And um, this is just another type of um, sensor and LED light set. Um, it's just one brand. There are others. Um, but this was sort of a um, partnership with this group and with Microsoft who um, had worked with Stitch Kit. Um, and they were integrating these into their fashions. And so it was a really exciting time for us to talk to them about what that meant and um, what it meant for the designers. And we were able to learn a little bit about how the designers um, were given these materials and worked with them. And then that culminated in the designers integrating these into their fashion designs, which we were able to see at the fashion show. And um, the next couple of pictures are gonna show how this looks in the fashion show. So here you can see the designer on, in the left-hand image is integrating the electronics into the um, apparel. And it's really um, sewn in so that you can't see the sensors and that sort of um, componentry. But then on the picture on the right, you can see that it's able to um, offer these subtle lighting effects that different designers used in different ways. So here, um, it can actually be a little hard to tell what's just sheen and what's the light, but you can see along the waist and then coming down a little bit, there's actually LED lights that are lit up in this item of clothing. And it's got gold accents as well, and this just gives it an additional sort of light element to it. And we can look at another example. Um, here you can see also around the waistband, um, with the belt, they're using the lights to further um, the eye catching. And it was very interesting to be able to see how this library was using e-textiles to teach fashion designers new and different skills that could allow them to really think about how they might integrate technology into their designs and um, you know, really think about ways to push their design in a way that maybe they hadn't thought about before. Um, and so that was a really interesting experience to get to see this being used, particularly um, by fashion designers who had been uh, already working as fashion designers and were really coming at it as just learning about the um, electronics side of it. Um, another library that we spoke to was um, North Carolina State University Libraries. Um, they actually have, uh, I spoke to Lauren DeMonte, but they have a pretty well established um, soft circuits, sewn circuits, and e-textiles programming set at their library. Um, they have a very robust makerspace, and they have um, support documentation. So this is actually a screenshot of a research guide that they have um, that will help you asynchronously get started with the concepts around um, soft circuits, sewn circuits, and e-textiles. And it allows you to sort of learn how you might integrate um, circuitry into your textile projects, but they also offer workshops and have equipment. So things like sewing machines and other machinery that students might not have access to, but that again would allow them to take this to the next level. And through their programming, they're really able to reach out to, as we were discussing before, different students, both those who are more knowledgeable about and interested in the textile side of things, and also those who are more coming from the STEM background and are more interested in the technology piece. And it brings these students together and allows them to um, learn new skills together as a group. And in particular, um, they've hosted specialized workshops as well. So this image here on the right is actually from a special program for NCSU's Women in Science and Engineering or WISE program students. 
that basically brought all of the students from this one program together, almost as an orientation at the beginning of the program where they learned how to integrate um, circuitry into um, basically wristbands. You can sort of see them in the previous image. If we go back when you can see one, someone wearing at a different event, a similar type of wristband. And that gave them a chance to have a program where um, they brought together all these students and taught them a new skill that built on their interest in science. And this combination um, of workshops, equipment, and some guides also has as its final piece, lectures. They bring in people who are using e-textiles in exciting ways, whether it's students, people from outside the community, and have them also talk as inspiration to those who might be interested in um, using this sort of technology in their own work going forward. Um, and then we also spoke to school librarians. So um, we also talked, spoke to a school librarian and classroom teacher, um, Susan Eberhardt and Edith Rohr from Edgewood Middle School, who were partnering so that the librarian would assist the classroom teacher in bringing these skills to the classroom. And they also did a similar, you can see they did a wristband project and they also did projects where students could create um, stuffed characters that lit up. And basically it allowed students to learn both sewing skills and STEM skills brought together into one fun activity that also allowed them to bring a lot of creativity to the process since they were able to design their own items at the same time. Um, so really there's a lot of different ways these can be used in a lot of different libraries. We spoke to public libraries as well that had programming um, and we spoke to all different types of libraries, big and small, about how they use this um, type of programming to draw in diverse audiences and to appeal to people who maybe had never seen themselves doing circuitry or had never seen themselves doing textiles projects. And so there's really certain keys to success that I think are important to keep in mind, regardless of whether you are thinking about doing this in a library or in another setting. So if you're looking to do a program for a lot of people, I think that the first key to success is that it's great to look for partners. So what you'll see about of all of the projects that I highlighted is that they really were about partnerships. It wasn't about the library doing it themselves. It was really about a lot of times they were partnering with someone else. So NCSU partnered with the WISE program to do specialized programming for them. Um, Brooklyn Fashion Academy partnered with people who could come in and teach the technology piece and also provide the technology equipment. It's not that you can't do it alone, but I think where you can partner, there's a lot that can be offered because it opens it up to a new audience and it opens it up to people with new skills. Um, I also do think it's important to be prepared for a range of different skills amongst participants. So um, we sort of talked about this before, but a lot of times when you're doing a program, you're really going to get people with somewhat similar backgrounds because they're interested in the topic. But with e-textiles, there really are these two different groups of people who are interested in it. People who see themselves as primarily interested in the textile piece and people who see themselves as primarily interested in the technology piece. And that means that you're not only going to have a range of skills within each of those halves, but also you're going to have people who identify really strongly with only one, <coughs> one piece of the program or the other. Um, you also want to have a respect for both the tech and the craft skills. You don't want to shortchange either one of them. They really are both equally important. Um, the sewing skills are really just as important as um, understanding how the circuit works in terms of having a final project that actually works. And I think where you can allow people to be adaptable, that really works well. So you want to create a project, but you want to allow for creativity and adaptation. Um, so a lot of what we have seen in the examples that you saw, it's not so much about having everybody copy an example. Instead, it's about here are the skills and here's a lot of different things and you can pick what your exact design will look like, but these are the rules you have to follow for the circuit to work at the end of the day or for your stitches to be knotted properly. But you wanna give people creativity with <laughs> once they've been given those sort of parameters. And 
particularly for libraries and makerspaces, I think it's important to build a collection to support the program. So you want to have additional um, resources that people can turn to if they get really inspired and want to go beyond what you're teaching. Um, do you have ideas of where to point them? And that doesn't necessarily have to mean buying books, but maybe just identifying websites that you would recommend, identifying maybe even people that you would point them to look at their online presence to see what they've done for inspiration. And be ready for the fact that, you know, maybe a program will fail, maybe a circuit will fail, and just don't be afraid of that and know that it might happen. And if you're an individual who's here because you're really interested in e-textiles and getting started with them, I think there's some sort of similar things to think about, but slightly different. I would say first you want to try to start simple. Um, you don't want to look for inspiration to a professionally created e-textile item and be annoyed with yourself if your first attempt doesn't look exactly like that. Um, and recognize that there are all these different skills that you have to develop. So even if you feel like you already know how to sew, the circuitry does add something. Even if you feel like you already really understand the circuitry, learning how to weave is a skill that people spend years developing. So you really want to recognize that there's a lot that goes into this and appreciate that. Um, but do look to outside sources for inspiration. I think that can be a really good way to get your <coughs> creativity going and see what all the possibilities are with e-textiles. Um, I think it's best to start with goals and not tools. We talked about how there are a variety of tools out there, um, and I think it's really valuable to focus more on what you're hoping to achieve, maybe even do a tentative design first, and then look to see what best supports getting to that point. And just know that it's going to take a lot of practice. And again, you shouldn't fear failure. Your first project might not be um, what you want it to be, but that's true of basically every time you do a first project in both science and in crafting. I'd like to add, though, that your tools can also, uh, starting with goals and not tools uh, is really good advice. Um, but I want to emphasize something that I think that Carly has already mentioned, and that is that <clears throat> You have respect for both both dis disciplines, but one can inform and inspire the other. So, when you learn, for instance, that um, that if uh, a current is running through something taut, it will run at a different uh, with a different level of voltage than when it's slack. This can inspire you once you really get used to the materials to think of things that you could do with that. So, for instance, what does it mean that a light might come on when I pull something, right? Uh, taut, but it, but when I let that fabric go slack, maybe that circuit isn't um, isn't carrying the current as well as it could. That can seem like a mistake, but it's also a teaching moment if you're doing these programs or if you're uh, learning on your own. But it can also be an inspiration point, right? Um, and so understanding the tools can can also provide inspiration because it can get you thinking about how materials interact with each other. Um, so maybe not so much tools like the highfalutin, like microcontrollers and all of that, but understanding the materials, of course, can be a source of information. And some of that is building on like starting to learn about how electricity works, how circuitry works, um, can be a really inspirational to the textile side of it and vice versa. The qualities of fabrics, what does woven fabric do? The knitting fabric um, doesn't act like, you know, the stretchability of uh, sort of knitted things versus the, uh, the ability to make something woven be almost like a flat plane. Um, so it's a mix, it's a mix. Next slide, sorry. <laughs> or did you have another slide, Carly? No, it's just not going. There we go. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I just wanted to round it up. Uh, I mean, Carly has made so many brilliant points and there's so many people out there that we reached out to. And I'll tell you that Brooklyn Fashion Show was amazing. It was really amazing. I'm not sure that stitch kit itself still exists in that form. So there's another good reason not to just focus on the tools. So when we put together uh, the 
one of the final sections of the book, not the very final section, is literally a list of lessons, uh, sort of planned out what materials you'll need, how to set up the lesson, the very practical stuff. Um, and we more or less uh, tried to scaffold um, some skills um, when in the order that we put uh, these uh, these uh, lesson plans into the book. So we start off with simple circuits with the light up wristband and you work your way all the way through parallel circuits and then working with different types of conductive materials. And then the, the last projects are uh, focused more on the microcontrollers and truly interactive e-textiles. Um, as opposed to soft circuits, which are a type of e-textile, e but, um, you know, so we're, it really was an attempt to scaffold the learning, um, as well as offer a variety um, of, uh, of types of programming for different levels of learners and people and different skill levels. Um, so this is just some of what is offered in, in the book in terms of ready-made, more or less ready-made lesson plans. And we tried to keep all kinds of things in mind, explaining terminology and um, you know, where to get materials, where our own inspiration came from. Um, some of the projects uh, are well known and there's lots of documented ways to complete them. Others were sort of reverse engineered um, from looking at things that we were inspired by and saying, oh, how is how did they do that? And uh, so the conductive weaving project in particular was was that way. And to a certain extent, also the the needle felting, which I'm glad we in, uh, included. Uh, oh, so nice. that was fun, right? Yeah, I, mean, I just <laughs> have to interject. We, I have that was went one to of a those... few of these events and um, the felting. I had no idea this was even a thing. It was completely brand new and it was so much fun. And some of these projects we haven't done at all in our program. So this is not, we're not trying to represent just what we've done at FIT. Um, we we learned a lot as uh, as Carly has pointed out by reaching out and, and looking at how other libraries have situated this, this kind of um, programming. Um, so um, just wanted to also give some practical um, um, advice on how to set up a particular uh, program for people. Uh, so the next slide, I guess, is the last one. Okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, great. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Helen and Carly. That was fantastic. Um, so I, right now, um, I'd like to open it up for questions for our authors. So you can either uh, write something in the chat, um, or if you'd like, I can unmute you if you have a question. I, I have a question actually. Okay. Um, so I was just wondering, how did you guys, how did you come together and decide to write this book? Oh like, gosh, do you remember Carly? Exactly how, I think you were the instigator, yes? Okay. Um, it was shortly <laughs> after I had started actually working at the FIT library. And um, I knew Helen was also really interested in um, these types of projects. So I um, asked her whether or not she would be interested in putting in a proposal to do a book for this series because I was familiar with the series. The book is actually part of a series that covers a lot of different topics actually around library services. Um, so it's not just related to makerspace type um, topics. It really covers a wide range of different topics in the series. And um, so I um, was the one who got Helen to agree to do it. Hopefully she's glad about that. <laughs> but, absolutely, yeah. I am. Absolutely. I um it was it was it was a lot it was a lot of it was more work than I thought it was because I thought, oh, this will be a cinch. We've done this. Mm -hmm. No. I mean it's really very different to describe for other people what you already have in your head for one thing. Um, and that with particular in, in particularly in relation to um to the actual lesson, the actual program uh, plans that we put in the book, um, but also really, um, you know, you can know what you know about coding or circuitry, but when you're writing a book, obviously you're gonna need to, uh, you know, really <laughs> um, back that up with a little bit more like, well, because I know it, you know, you have to, so it was, it was, it was a lot of, it was work and it was a lot of fun, you know, it was great. 
Um, and I'm glad we were able to, to get it out um, in time uh, before. Uh, yeah, there's a question. Is there another question? Yes, there is actually. Okay, um, so uh, one question is, um, how do we get the book? If we want to read the book, how do we get it? Well, um, there's going to be a copy in the FIT library. So if you're a member of the FIT community, um, you can definitely check it out from the library starting relatively soon, I think. Um, and um, it's also available um, via interlibrary loan and um, you can buy it on Amazon, I know, and in other bookstores. Um, and I saw that there was now also a question about whether or not there's an ebook version. Yeah. And I believe that there is, um, though I don't um, know of any libraries that have the ebook version of this particular one. Okay, um, I have an interesting question here. Um, as many of these um, projects deal with batteries and other tech, um, do you have advice on recycling or reusing safely any of the materials? Well, um, some of the some of the programs um, do come uh, do some of the some of the programs require these um, lipo cell batteries, and these are basically rechargeable to a certain extent. Um, as for the coin cell batteries, I we did not include anything about recycling in our text. That's a very good question, and. Um, we do uh, provide coin cell batteries for students when our when we are doing projects, but with regard to the book, that is not something that we included, and that's a very good um, question. Maybe um, the next book. Maybe the next book. Yes. Yeah. Oh. As for safety, if that's another question with batteries, I have to say that most soft circuit and e textile. Um, programs that libraries are undertaking are really, you're not really talking about a lot of high voltage um, uh, battery use. Um, when you think about a coin cell battery, um, it's a three volt, right? Um, these lipo cell batteries are certainly more than that. Uh, these would be more for your microcontrollers, um, the coin cell more for the soft circuit. Um, the when you when you are running uh, a current through conductive thread, you basically really don't need. Um, it, it's such a low voltage that if anything, it might tingle or be warm, but you don't need to really insulate more than what the natural sort of insulation that happens when you're incorporating something into a fabric. If that makes sense, because we really are talking very, very, very low voltage. Um, I um saw another... that... oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. But there are ways to do it though. I mean, there are ways and times to do it as well. And there's times when you should be using maybe a resistor for a project um, just to moderate the, the current. We do um, talk about it a little bit, the safety issues a bit. What and... about weather? Yeah, um, I saw that can question. you see textiles? Mm -hmm. Not so basically um it's probably not going to be dangerous, but it's probably going to wreck your project if it gets yes. wet. So mm -hmm. you yes. don't really have to worry that you're going to get injured. But um, in most of the projects that we're talking about, we don't go to that degree of making sure that it's waterproof because that would involve um, more sewing skills at a minimum, certainly, depending on how you did it. Um, and we're not assuming that people are going to get up to that sort of high level of skill. Um, you can buy e-textiles that are certainly safe in all weathers, but most of the ones that we um, talk about in the book, and I think we probably even mentioned this in, for some of them, if you had to wash it, for example, you remove a lot of the electronics before you do that, um, and generally they shouldn't get wet. But in terms of um, commercially available e-textiles, there are ways to waterproof stuff. So you, there are definitely some e-textiles that can be displayed outside, just probably not your mm -hmm. um, earlier stage projects. Thank yeah, you. exactly. And we do have a section in the book on uh, ideas for costume. And with costume, for instance, um, both 
because you might be wearing these costumes to a concert or to an event, but also because they are costume, right? We have some advice about um, how to uh, make elements that, uh, in a way, it's not really true e-textile because it's more you've incorporated some sort of um, either uh, decorative or interactive circuitry into a garment, but it, it sort of, it doesn't live in the garment itself. It's something that can be easily removed. Um, and this is common with sort of the kind of costume that you might see at Comic Con or something like that. Oftentimes those kinds of, um, uh, those kinds of, um, uses they they're not using conductive thread as much as they might be using like um fine electric wire that they've somehow hidden in hems and in parts of the garment and that stitch kit that was mentioned that was used in the uh, brooklyn fashion show uh that was insulated right um mm -hmm. and insulation also allows the current to carry further so if you wanted to do something really ornate or where you wanted the current not to sort of like um <clears throat> dissipate right um you would want to insulate so it's not just for safety it's also like how far do you want that electricity to travel um mm -hmm. and there's a certain amount of dissipation that happens um even you know when something's low volt uh, especially that i've seen people try to make for instance something with conductive thread on a simple circuit and they've made a long um it's a piece of textile and 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 the current fails to travel to the final light in an effective way right so you do there's but there is advice about you know when would you use a parallel circuit when would you use a simple circuit why it might one might be better than the other there is some information about how to insulate um and what to expect of certain types of fabrics <clears throat> um does that, I sort of went off topic. That's a good, no, no, that's good. Um, Jennifer <laughs> has a question here, which okay. I actually was wondering about as well. Probably other people too. What's your favorite project or like an event that you've done so far? From an event or from the book? Oh, um, either one. I think either one. Well, Car well, the favorite from that we've, that I've done is, um, yeah, I really do have to say it must it's either going to be the conductive weaving just because that was so much fun as a collaborative project mm -hmm. with everybody involved. Because we actually I got donations. I said, everybody <laughs> give me your donated wool <laughs> yarn, right? Because um, we need a lot of yarn for students. We ended up with gobs and gobs and gobs and gobs of leftover yarn from people's knitting projects and other things. It was wonderful. And um, also that was enjoyable because it was um, it was something I hadn't really seen other people do. And the but the needle felting, I think, was can I have two? Yeah, the needle felting was probably my favorite. Um, yeah, yeah. I really enjoyed the needle felting. I think it's really um, a fun project and um, yeah, I really like it. Uh, I, I think that that's the one that also I think makes some of the cuter little characters that you can make. Yeah. So, so would you say on a whole, there it is. That's one of the felting oh, yeah. creatures. Do you see the, you see the light of the belly button? <laughs> yep. And he's eating, he's eating a little um, battery there. A the little monster eats the battery. Yep. So, yep. Cute. so do you prefer the low tech or the high tech? I mean, projects. I think for me, I actually really like the low tech ones, like the ones where you can make it very approachable so that it's something that everybody can, especially for maker minds, since we do have sort of that pop up approach to programming. I really like it when it's something that people can come in, um, maybe not feel like they know a whole lot about it and stick around for a couple hours and leave with a finished project that they're yeah. really happy about that allows them to be creative and learn something new, whether it's about um embroidery or circuits or conduction or whatever but just for them to be able to walk away with like new information and a little fun thing that they created i really um like mm -hmm. that's my favorite absolutely topic. when we do the more high-tech things we usually concentrate on um on the coding aspect of it uh, and we can't 
although we're happy to give away little, you know, strands of <laughs> conductive thread and, and LEDs, and that's part of the cost of the programming. Um, even though uh, microcontrollers are becoming more affordable, like the circuit playground um, that I just had out is, is fairly affordable. They're not affordable enough to be like, oh yeah, go home with this, right? <laughs> uh, so, um, so with those programs, it's maybe not as much fun because in terms of a program for, for me, when I just think of the fun of like what everybody just said, however, it is the Arduino programming um, of, and it was with the lily pad, not with the circuit playground. And, uh, you know, downloading the Arduino IDE can be kind of a little bit of a problem on um, institutional computers sometimes that ran into a little bit of issue with that. And then you're in there and you're doing a lot of scripting and some students that's brand new to them. But I found that um, with that particular project, I had students who came back to me and said, I incorporated this in my final fashion project, right? So with, with that kind of thing, with the more advanced stuff where people were actually working with microcontrollers and programming and um, they, the people who came, a lot of them came away saying, yes, this is, mm -hmm. this is something I can put into my, fa my the fashion design students who, who participated. And it also got their interest in courses that have existed at our college for a while and resources that have existed for a while that were sort of not on their radar for whatever reason. Um, and being able to offer a, you know, you don't really need to know anything kind of class. We'll, we'll teach you the basics here and you can do it. Just a short workshop allowed them to feel that they could go on and take an entire course in um, physical computing or in um, a design course that was um, going to focus on um, the technology of mm -hmm. textiles. Um, so, and that's what we should be doing uh, it, with the kind of library that we are, is really supporting the curriculum and helping students like sort of uh, bridge um, certain disciplines, I think. And I would say that- Oh, we have time for a- Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Carly. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I think that that's one nice thing about um, e textile programming for libraries more generally is that it makes it very um, approachable for people and it might really inspire them to think about mm -hmm. a new skill. But if it feels really difficult to them, they're not really going to necessarily want to go out and buy the equipment themselves or try to learn it on their own. So I think it's a real opportunity for libraries to make this by just giving people one time to try it and make it feel approachable and make them not worry that they're going to sort of fail at something where they've spent money on getting a microcontroller or something like that. Right. And um, it really might inspire in them a whole new interest, a whole new hobby that they maybe wouldn't have found otherwise. So that's one of the huge advantages I see for libraries and makerspaces of doing this type of programming. Okay. Um, well, there's a question here from Matthew. This is more of a technical question. Um, okay. He is asking, I want to read it right, right from there. Um, is there information about the total light load for one circuit? Yes, it depends on what light you're using though. I mean, what you, like when you buy uh, sewable LED lights, they generally, um, different colors uh, have different draws. Um, what I think, um, I'm gonna forget now, I think red, uh, yellow and white. <laughs> One of the, like, now I'm forgetting because you're blank, because you asked me a tough question, Matthew, yeah. but like the answer is that it's complicated. But when you buy the equipment and we'll tell you what, um, you know, what voltage is required for uh, powering that device. So what you need to do is also need to do some math. So let's say you have an LED that pulls uh, 1.5, right? Um, and you have a three voltage um, coin cell. Um, how many lights are you really gonna be able to get to light up at full um, luminescence, if I'm using the right word, you're the lighting designer, right? Um, it, you might have some dim lights if you're trying to put too much on one circuit. Mm -hmm. A parallel circuit um, can distribute that a little bit differently though than, than if you were just doing a simple circuit. Um, so it depends. <laughs> and you do need to do your research when you're buying the equipment. 
Okay. Thank you. Um, any more questions? We have time for a couple, I think, or at least one, one more. Are there other institutions and centers that are involved in e-textiles other than libraries? I, I believe so. Oh. Carly, do you? Uh... Um, yeah, I think that a lot of times there are um, other organizations that, I mean, we, I think, have faculty who are interested in e-textiles at um, FIT. I know that some schools um, that I spoke to, um, the people who help run their programming are graduate students who are working with e-textiles in their programs, whether that's a textile program, an engineering program. Um, you know, there's medical. a lot of different medical. Yeah, there's a lot of medical applications for this. Um, so there are a lot of different applications, which means that there might be different places on a campus um, or different organizations in general that are working with this. I do think that in terms of this type of programming after libraries at the next most common place to find this is probably maker spaces. Um, but there are going to definitely be um, e textile programs available in a lot of different settings these days. And online, um, both, um, uh, both SparkFun and Adafruit um, have a lot, a lot of um, advice and videos on e textiles and how to use various components that they're trying to sell to you. Um, and there are also some textile artists who um, have collectives. Uh, there's one based out of Austria that has a has wonderful stuff. Um, if you're just looking for inspiration, are you looking to like learn how to do this elsewhere than libraries? So the question is, mm -hmm. yes, it can be. It can be transferred. A lot of the knowledge can be transferred to jewelry design. We um, decided when we were uh, beginning to write this book not to talk about um, to make a distinction between e-textiles and wearable tech um, mm -hmm. to a certain extent although some of the costume stuff we talk about is wearable tech in a way because you sort of you put it on a garment like you would a brooch right but it's not actually part of the garment um, <clears throat> so but it you can transfer a lot of this to jewelry design and if you um, if you go uh, if you go to instructables or to sparkfun.com or to the Adafruit uh, page, you will also find some jewelry design applications. We just decided not to cover jewelry, even though it is personal adornment, because we wanted to concentrate on the textile aspect um, and conductive. Um, textiles themselves, you know, more or less. Does that make sense? Okay. Thank you so much. This is a great presentation on e textiles for librarians and for everyone else too. Um, so if you'd like more information on FIT authors or how to submit um, to be featured, go to the website at authors.fitnyc.edu. And you can also follow us on Instagram for info on upcoming FIT author talks at FIT NYC library. <laughs> F actually, I'm going to put it right in the chat, okay? There, so then um, it's a little easier. Because the last letter is a, a capital letter. So here is our Instagram. Um, I also want to share, if you don't mind, the uh, site in Austria. Um, and I'm just, I'm having trouble reading in this light. That's embarrassing. Um, it's kobakant.at. Um, I think that is right. But if you Google how to get what you want, like literally how to get what you want with the word e-textiles, um, you will find some amazing things that really take uh, e-textiles to a very high level, uh, a high level of DIY um, crafting. Um, so just type in how to get what you want, e-textiles, uh, if, if that link that I gave you, um, or e-textile, e-textiles doesn't work. It was a very inspirational site, very. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> Great job.
<laughs> okay, so I hope um, I see everyone else at another FIT Authors Talks. So, um, so have a good evening. Good night. Good night. Good night.